Tonight, founding day. China marks 75 years of the People's Republic of the State with flags raising ceremonies and National Guard salute. New reign. Shenru Ushiba formally voted in by parliament as Japan's Prime Minister following his victory in one of the closest ever leadership races of the LDP. Fatal crash. Dozens of children are feared dead following a bus crash in the Thailand's capital, Bangkok. And time travel found. The concept sale in Los Angeles is feeding the imagination of enthusiastic time travelers. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. With the latest updates across the globe for this Tuesday, I'm Amasha Fernando. And let's take a look at the latest situation in China. A grand flag-raising ceremony was held at the Tiananmen Square in Beijing this morning to mark the 75th founding anniversary of the People's Republic of China. After trumpet soldiers sounding their clarions, the, na the national flag was escorted into the square by 96 members of the Chinese People's Liberation Army Guard of Honor. Many Chinese have developed the custom to watch a national flag raising ceremony at the Tiananmen Square as a way to celebrate the National Day. Thousands of spectators from all over the country gathered at the square, waiting for hours to witness the exciting moment. They sang the Chinese national anthem while watching the national flag going up. Many held national flags in their hands and had stickers of the national flag on their faces. The middle of the square was decked out with an eye-catching 18-meter-tall flower basket decorated for the National Day. Meanwhile, Hong Kong leader John Lee said that Hong Kong is reversing the dilemma of negative economic growth at an official ceremony, marking the 75th anniversary of the founding of modern China. Shigeru Ishiba was formally voted in by parliament as Japan's prime minister today following his victory in one of the closest ever leadership races for the ruling Liberal Democratic Party. For more on this, we have other than a World News special correspondent, Rasen Sushandu Dasa from Tokyo in Japan. Japan has a new leader. Shigeru Ishiba-san from the ruling LDP was elected as Japan's 102nd Prime Minister today. Ishiba-san having won the LDP leadership election by narrowly edging out a proud favorite Takaiji-san a few days ago, was officially announced as the new Prime Minister in an extraordinary parliamentarian session today. So this is a very uh, extraordinary achievement by uh, someone like Shigeru Ishida-san. Ishiba-san first ran for the leadership election. Uh, he voted to be the Prime Minister in 2012, but he was narrowly edged out by ex-Prime Minister Abe. Then he tried two more times to win the leading LDP leadership election. But having failed all these times, his luck finally worked and he finally achieved his long lasting dream of leading LDP as well as leading uh, Japan. Interestingly, even before he announced uh, as a prime minister, he, uh, he already declared that he will have a snap election by the end of October. And most would think that would be October 27th. So the actual tenure of Ishiba-san would be very short, less than a month but he has a high chance of winning the next election. While the ruling LDP's popularity has waned past few months, mostly due to the financial scandals, Ishiba-san is a popular figure among general public. As well as this election showed, he's also popular among the LDP voters. Even though the CDP, the main opposition party, is getting strength and they have already elected a new leader, uh, ex-Prime Minister Noda, people would still bet Ishiba-san and LDP to pull through the next election. So Japan have a new prime minister and Japan may probably have another election and perhaps a new leader by end of October. Over to you. Thank you. That was other than a world news special correspondent Rasita Chandudasa from Tokyo in Japan. Major floods and landslides triggered by relentless rainfall have battered Nepal, killing almost 200 people and causing widespread destruction. Officials reported that the death toll from the monsoon floods and landslides have risen across the Himalayan nation, with over 30 people still missing and many others injured. 
In central Nepal, a big rescue operation is underway. Anxious Nepalese watch workers clear the mud which has buried part of this mountain road as they search for anyone who might have survived the deadly landslide after a weekend of heavy rainfall across the country. The capital of Nepal was cut off as landslides blocked roads leading in and out of Kathmandu. At least three buses stuck in traffic were buried on a highway south of the city, killing dozens. In the city centre, local vendors clean up what remains of their businesses after the Bagmati River flowing through Kathmandu broke its banks, damaging shops located nearby. The southern part of Kathmandu was hit particularly hard by flooding, with many residents evacuated on rafts or wading through waist-deep water. As the weather has calmed down and authorities have stepped up their rescue and recovery operations, the Nepalese government announced temporary shelters would be built for those who lost their homes and financial aid given to the families of those killed. Schools will close across the country at least for the next three days. A bus carrying dozens of primary school children has crashed and caught fire just outside the Thai capital of Bangkok. 16 children and 3 teachers are reported to have escaped, but 22 pupils and 3 teachers are still unaccounted for, according to the country's transport minister. Thailand's prime minister said the accident resulted in deaths and injuries, but the exact number of fatalities had not yet been confirmed. Eight of the 19 people who managed to escape were sent to the hospital for treatment. The bus was one of three that were carrying children and teachers returning from a school field trip in northern province of Uthai Thani. The transport minister said the bus was powered by extremely risky compressed natural gas. Thailand's Prime Minister, meanwhile, has ordered ministers to visit the scene. Piala Tinkau, who was leading the search, said the bodies of those killed were so badly burned it was hard to identify them. The bus was travelling on a highway into Bangkok where a tyre burst, sending it crashing into a burial. Stone-throwing protesters in Pakistan's southern city of Karachi clashed with the police who stopped them from reaching the U.S. consulate during demonstrations over Israel's killing of Hezbollah leader Syed Hassan Nasrallah. Protesters chanted death to America while carrying Hezbollah flags and posters of Nasrallah. Police said seven officers were injured and receiving treatment in hospitals from stones thrown by protesters, adding that protesters had tried to reach areas beyond cordons agreed upon with organisers in advance. A police spokesman said authorities would register criminal cases against protesters who acted violently. Pro-Iran Shade Religious Political Party Majlis Vahatul Muslimin had organised a rally of around 3,000 people in the country's most populous city. Sunni Muslims in Pakistan's Lahore and Islamabad also marched on the streets and performed symbolic funeral prayers for Nasrallah. Shifting our focus to the Middle East now, it appears that Israel has launched its widely expected ground offensive in Lebanon after weeks of escalating tensions in the region. The Israeli military says it has begun a limited ground operation early today, targeting Hezbollah in the southern Lebanon. Loud explosions were reported across Beirut, Lebanon's capital, early Tuesday, as the Israeli military announced the start of targeted ground raids. In a statement released on Tuesday, the military indicated that the Israel Defense Forces had begun limited, localized and targeted ground raids against Hezbollah positions in the southern Lebanon border area. According to Israel, the operation dubbed Northern Arrows is focused on targets in villages near the border that pose an immediate threat to northern Israel. The Lebanese militant group on Monday vowed to continue its fight against Israel, pledging support for the Palestinians and asserting that its forces are prepared for a ground engagement if Israeli troops enter by land. This statement comes in the wake of Israel's recent airstrike in Beirut that killed Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah and other senior figures. Amid the escalating tensions between Israel and Hezbollah, Israel's attack on Lebanon have killed over a thousand people in the past two weeks. According to the Lebanese Prime Minister, these attacks have also displaced more than one million people in Lebanon. Israeli officials have stated that the ground assault will not lead to a long-term occupation. However, it remains unclear how deep the operations will go or how long they are expected to last. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news right after this.
And on the road to the White House tonight, former President Donald Trump visited Hurricane Hit Waldosa in Georgia, while Kamala Harris returned to the Washington, D.C. for a briefing on the hurricane response by FEMA. Both camps hot on each other's trails on the handling of the natural disaster. Tonight, Vice President Kamala Harris at FEMA headquarters in Washington, D.C., briefed on the deadly storm that gutted the southeast. To everyone who has been impacted by this storm, and to all of those of you who are rightly feeling overwhelmed by the destruction and the loss, our nation is with you. And President Biden and I, and all of the folks behind me, are with you. Harris cutting her campaign schedule short this weekend, flying back to Washington, her team releasing this image. The vice president on Air Force Two after speaking with the head of FEMA. She also has spoken with the governors of battered Georgia and North Carolina. North Carolina officials asking Harris and President Biden not to visit just yet. The security challenge would be too great for the struggling state. Earlier today, former President Donald Trump traveling to Georgia, meeting with local officials in devastated Valdosta. Throughout the region, our hearts are with you. In Georgia, a crucial battleground, Trump repeatedly falsely stating that the state's Republican governor, Brian Kemp, has not been able to reach President Biden. The governor's doing a very good job. He's having a hard time getting the president on the phone. I guess uh, they're, not, they're not being responsive. The federal government is not being responsive. But earlier this morning, the Republican governor said Biden actually did call him over the weekend and offered his full support. U.S. officials reported more than 100 deaths across a half a dozen states due to the Helene, the powerful storm that was a major hurricane when it slammed in the flo into Florida's Big Bend region before cutting a destructive path through Georgia and into the Carolinas. The death toll from Hurricane Helene surpassed 100 on Monday, days after the storm tore through the southeastern United States. And the White House said the number of storm-related deaths could go much higher. Here's U.S. Homeland Security Advisor Liz Sherwood Randall. In North Carolina, Sheriff Quentin Miller said Buncombe County was especially hard hit. Footage from the unincorporated communities of Bat Cave and Mill Spring, North Carolina, showed the extent of some of the damage, with homes, roads, and bridges decimated. We're not leaving until the job is done. U.S. President Joe Biden said he will soon travel to the South for a first-hand look at the devastation and pledged full support to the affected areas. Vice President Kamala Harris cut short a campaign trip in Nevada on Monday to take part in briefings in Washington on the hurricane response. Meanwhile, Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump visited Valdosta, Georgia, where he said he spoke to billionaire Elon Musk about getting Starlink Internet access to affected areas. Later, the White House said dozens of Starlink satellite systems were in use in North Carolina, with over 100 more in transit to other areas, after Trump falsely claimed that the systems had not been deployed yet. Close to 2 million homes and businesses across the southeast remained without power on Monday, according to PowerOutage.us. Production will remain suspended indefinitely at a Tata Electronics plant in southern India that makes Apple iPhone components after weekend fire. Production at Tata Electronics iPhone plant in southern India will remain halted indefinitely after a weekend fire. That was according to Indian officials on Monday, and the cause of the blaze is still unknown. A Saturday fire at the Tamil Nadu plant injured 10 and halted production, affecting Apple's iPhone supply chain as it looks to grow in India. The tech giant hasn't commented on the incident, while Tata said the cause of the fire is being investigated and safety protocols protected its employees. On Monday, rescue teams were still clearing debris, and inspections were difficult due to the heavy damage. The plant produces key iPhone components, while an adjoining building is expected to start assembling the phones by year end. The condition of that building remained unclear. Tata Electronics is part of the $165 billion Tata Group and is a major Apple supplier in India, alongside Taiwan's Foxconn. Austria entered uncharted territory after the far right scored a historical national election win with the parties facing an uphill task to form a new government. The far-right Freedom Party under Herbert Kickel has rapidly regained ground loss in the string of corruption scandals, winning 28.8% in the Sunday's vote, according to preliminary projections. 
some branding anti-Nazi banners, dozens of protesters gathered outside the Vienna Parliament building after Sunday's general election, which saw the far-right Freedom Party secure an unprecedented victory. Austria's Freedom Party has bounced back from the Ibiza-gate scandal in 2019 that saw the then Vice-Chancellor and Freedom Party leader, Heinz Christian Strache, resign. Taking the reins of the party in 2021, Herbert Kickel has tapped into concerns about immigration in Austria and has capitalised on anger at the government's response to the Covid pandemic. His party is critical of Islam and it's pushing for tougher laws on asylum seekers. Kickel is also against giving aid to Ukraine. He wants sanctions against Russia to be lifted, arguing that they harm Austria more than Moscow. Only the conservative Austrian People's Party, the OVP, has offered any suggestion it could work with the FPO, but has insisted it is unwilling to do so with Kickel. If Kickel fails to ally with another party, this could end the FPO's aspirations to govern and enable a coalition of more moderate parties. The US National Transportation Safety Board said more than 40 foreign operations of Boeing 737 airplanes may be using planes with rudder components that could pose safety risks. US watchdogs say foreign airlines may be using Boeing 737 jets with faulty parts that could pose a safety risk. The National Transportation Safety Board said Monday that more than 40 carriers could be using planes with faulty rudders. Last week, it issued urgent recommendations following analysis of a February incident on a United Airlines jet. That saw one of the pilot's rudder pedals become stuck while landing at New York's Newark airport. No one was hurt in the incident, which was linked to a part in an optional landing system fitted to some planes. Now regulators say no US carriers still have aircraft with the faulty component, but at least 40 foreign ones may do. They didn't name the airlines involved, but the NTSB says there is a potential safety risk. It says two foreign operators suffered similar incidents in 2019. The watchdog criticised Boeing for failing to notify airlines about the part, which it says some may not even know is fitted. There was no comment Monday from the aerospace giant, though it said last week that it had told operators about the potential problem. It's all just the latest headache for the firm, which has endured a tumultuous year. That started with a mid-air blowout on one of its 737 MAX jets, which was traced to missing bolts on a critical fuselage part. The incident put renewed focus on the company's manufacturing quality and has crimped its ability to up output of the jets, its best-selling product. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. And finally tonight, a concept store in Los Angeles is feeding the imagination of enthusiastic time travelers. The convenience store offering dinosaur eggs to futuristic gadgets is also a creative hub aimed at nurturing future writers. Many of us only think about time travel, but a store in Los Angeles is feeding the imagination. The Echo Park Time Travel Mart has historic and futuristic merchandise. Whether you're in the market for dinosaur eggs or you want to make a phone call to the future, a trip here can help you imagine yourself in any time period. But there's something bigger going on behind the scenes. So we come through here, this is our wormhole. The back door transports you to a new space, a place that wants to cultivate the writers of tomorrow. 826 LA is a nonprofit that provides free creative writing programs for students. Juliana Hernandez, who's now 18, says the organization helped her grow as a writer. She's one of many student authors who have had their work published through the program. This is the last book that I did um, my senior year of high school. It's a book about food. Money earned from the Time Travel Mart helps fund the writing program, which works with about 6,000 students a year. It makes sense. After all, for now, time travel only exists because of writers. And with that, we mark the end of today's bulletin. We will see you again tomorrow with the latest updates across the globe. Stay tuned as Sanovi Mudan Nayaka will join you next with the nightly business report. Until then, have a